Hi everybody, I'm Nicole Smith and welcome back to From the Suggestion Box. My very special guest today is Mr. Tim Suda and he is the Disaster Workforce Engagement Manager for the American Red Cross of Georgia and focuses on the engagement, empowerment, and support of more than 1,000 volunteers across the state. Additionally, he is the Vice President of the Georgia Association for Volunteer Administration, which advocates, networks, and develops volunteer administration professionals across the state. Tim was a 2021 Association of Leaders and Volunteer Engagement Impact Award recipient for the Emerging Leader Award. He, is re he has presented for multiple organizations and conferences, developed training for both volunteers and for leaders of volunteers, and has been interviewed and featured in trade magazines, including the Volunteer Management Report. When he is not working or volunteering, he can be found in his amateur wood shop where he builds trinkets and ornaments as fundraisers. Tim, welcome, welcome, welcome. It is so great to have you. Thanks for having me this morning, Nicole. It's great to be great. here. I, I'm so glad. So a couple of things. So uh, what kind of ornaments do you make for fundraisers and how does that work? Yeah, so my wife and I, uh, as a couple hobby, uh, decided to start tinkering around in our wood shop. Uh, I will, uh, I'll design and cut and build um, usually holiday ornaments, uh, and my wife will paint them and do the finishing touches, um, and then we uh, we sell them as a as a fundraiser. Last holiday season, we sold over uh, eighty different ornaments and raised money for a local. Um, uh, animal rescue society here in Georgia and uh, it was a lot of fun to do it was a lot of fun to uh, to share the ornaments with family and friends and um, just you know another way to give back and and do something with my wife as a couple I I love that I love that I oh, I love that okay okay so uh, first of all, I want to say congratulations on being an Impact Award recipient. Um, and as I was sharing with you a little bit earlier, you know, it was very exciting because I got to be on the judging panel for the first time. And that is how I was first introduced to you. And you are very, 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 very impressive, um, obviously, because you won an award. Um, so let's talk a little bit about a lot. Okay, so first of all, a thousand volunteers across Georgia. How the heck do you manage that? Like, how how do you do that? Um, it it all boils down to empowerment. Uh, I have a really wonderful team of volunteers uh, that are fully empowered to make decisions on programs to support training to run um, even disaster deployments. So when we have disasters across the US, we send volunteers to help out. And uh, we have a team of about 40 volunteers that fully run that day to day and, and they own it and they take responsibility in it. And I, I would also say that a large part of that is my volunteer peer partner. Um, each, each one of our roles, we have a volunteer peer partner who, um, is is our equal um, there's there's not a line drawn between employee or volunteer and our organization it's really focused on you know everyone working towards our mission and everyone works towards our goal so my volunteer peer partner french brown is she's just an amazing individual um, i am so lucky to have her um, she's a star ski to my hut she's the good cop to my bad cop she's uh she's just you know an, an amazing partner to have okay so I got all sorts of questions now. Okay, so <laughs> peer partner. So what is the difference between staff member and peer partner? Um, so we we actually use staff member as an all-inclusive term, paid staff, unpaid staff. They're, they're all still staff, but a, a peer partner is a volunteer lead, um, a leader, a, a volunteer who leads teams of volunteers. So just like you and I, they're leaders of volunteers. Um, of course. And, uh, and, and they lead teams alongside uh, the, the you know, paid staff member. Um, the, the best metaphor that I can think of for it is think of, a, of an airplane. You have a pilot and a co-pilot. And at any given time, either one of them can be the one flying the plane, 
either one of them could be the one making decisions. Yeah, one of them has a little bit more responsibility or accountability than the other. Yeah, one of them has to get up at three o'clock in the morning and <laughs> deal with um, disasters or, or you know, incidents or situations, but they both have the same ability, the same skill set, the, you know, um, and they can fly that plane interchangeably. And in fact, you know, a, a lot of long flights, you're, you're not even sure which pilot's flying at any given time. And there's not a difference in the service and the flight. Um, and the same is true in the volunteer world uh, with, with our volunteer peer partners. It's really that pilot co-pilot. You'll never know if you were to look at anyone who's who um, and, uh, and it's just high quality work. So it's, it's hugely supportive. Um, it really focuses on empowering our volunteer leaders who are leaders of volunteers as well to, to make the decision and to, to have ownership of meeting the mission. I absolutely love that. And I'm going to be honest with you, on top of that, maybe just for a little bit for me, but I know a lot for some people, they are like, uh, empowered the volunteers to run things, uh, giving all power to a volunteer and letting them to like, how do you ease the uneasiness that somebody <laughs> just heard by saying, what do you mean you let the volunteers run everything? And do you really mean everything or do you say they run everything, but not really? No, uh, they, they really do run everything. And, and uh, the proof happens all the time. So uh, like I said, we respond to disasters um, all the time and, and I do as well. So it's not just our volunteers. And in uh, 2021, I spent a total of uh, 12 weeks deployed to different disasters. Well, while I was deployed assisting on a disaster, nothing fell apart while I was gone because our volunteer team literally handled everything. Um, I can be a phone a friend. I can be there to support, uh, you know, programmatically. We help define the guardrails and, and, you know, keep people in line uh, with the goals of the organization. But I've, I've always told the team that any decision they make, I'm gonna support them. We may have a conversation later about a different way of making that decision. Uh, but the, the big thing is that, uh, and every organization of any cloud has a mission statement. They have a vision. Organizations like the Red Cross and, and the Red Cross movement, we have our fundamental principles. If you're, the decisions you make as a leader, whether you're an employee who's paid or a, a volunteer who's paid in, in uh, filling your, your own cup and, and you know giving back or, or whatever your motivation may be, you're still going to make decisions within the vision and the mission and, and, the, and the principles and you know whatever those goals are for your organization. And um, it's no different than an employee making decisions. Uh, you know, we trust employees. They're human beings. They have experience. They have knowledge, skills. So do volunteers. It, the difference is, is really a paycheck. And like I said, a little bit of an accountability piece. Yes. Okay. I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Okay. Because I love this. And I'm just trying to, I'm, my brain just hears all of the questions that people are, hmm. So, okay. Yes. It's funny that you say we trust employees. Of course we do because they're getting paid. And if they don't do a good job, then we're like, hey, we're taking your check away. Um, so if you don't have a check to check away from a volunteer, how do you keep that uh, in check, so to speak? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, one of the things that's, that's, you know, we've been changing a lot in the world recently is that jobs aren't always just about the check. Um, that there's a lot more to it. You know, we've been seeing that more and more. COVID showed a lot of things um, that organizations had opportunities for. And, and I'm thankful that a lot of organizations have stepped up to that. Uh, but just, you know, a volunteer and an employee each have motivations for why they work with that organization. Money is a piece of it. Uh, most employees of organizations, they need to at least make some money to be able to live, exist, things like that. 
Um, but that's usually not the only reason, especially not in fields like ours and in anything in volunteering, anything in nonprofit, government type work, um, healthcare, anywhere you find volunteers, the, the employees, the paid employees who work in that area, it's usually because they connect to that mission. They see a way that they can also give back while also surviving and living. Uh, the, there are you know, great opportunities. And for our volunteers, it's the same. They have different motivations. It could be to, to build a resume. It could be to give back or pay it forward. Um, it could, it, any, any number of reasons. And um, frankly, it, it doesn't happen often. Um, in fact, it hasn't happened in a long time with, you know, with the group of volunteers that I support, but you can terminate volunteers just like you can terminate employees. Um, it's not something we like to talk about because uh, obviously that's, you know, worst case scenario, but just like employees have a process to go to with, okay, we do coaching. Okay. We do mentoring. We may put a, you know, together an improvement plan. We can, all of that can apply to volunteers as well. Um, and I, I find that so much of, of, you know, people who are curious about this or have never heard of it, it's more of just uh, there, there's an uh, uh, unintentional mental block between a paid staff and a volunteer staff. Um, but when it comes down to it, if you empower people, if you tap into whatever their motivations may be, whatever their passions are, it, it, it works so smoothly. It's a workforce multiplier. Uh, the, the organizations that are volunteer led like the American Red Cross really um, are able to take it to the next level. We, we could not afford um, even with all of the generous donations that come into our organization to pay for the amount of expertise that we have in volunteers. And, uh, and wait, so it's, hold on, it's just hold on. amazing. I have to, I just have to, I have to sit with that for a minute. <laughs> we could not afford to pay for the expertise that we have with our volunteers. Like that, that is a powerful statement because so many people have this weird, yes, this mental thing about if they're a volunteer, they feel like they like they're not intelligent because people are volunteering their time. Like they they leave all their brains at the door first. I and I don't understand what it is. And a lot of times these people have, um, you know, especially if they're older, they're retired, which means they're coming out at the top of their game in the business exactly. world. You know, they're executives and they're this and and, yep. and, and it's, people have this thought that because they decided to give their time and come and help, that maybe it may not necessarily be in the exact industry that, well, you don't know my industry, so clearly you don't know anything. Well, you know, transferable skills are transferable skills and, you know, Correct. an executive is going to know some things and it brings that experience. Um, also, I love what you said. Oh, I love what you said in terms of, hey, if we're having challenges with the volunteer, you go through a cultural plan, the same thing you do with um, an employee. And I love that because often so many people will say, or, you know, especially um, when dealing with interns, right? But also volunteers as well. I love that fact especially because um, I've heard so many times people will have, you know, a not so stellar experience with a volunteer or intern, and then they throw them all, oh, you ugh, volunteers, I just can't deal with them, or ugh, interns, right. they're the worst. And I'm like, but if you have one not so stellar employee, you don't fire everybody. I'm like, I'm never exactly. hiring anybody ever again. No. You, what do you do? You coach through it. You try to figure out what the challenges are. You work through it and either things progress or at that, at certain point, you determine maybe this just isn't the best fit, but you don't ever just say, well, I'm doing everything by myself forever. And I'm never hiring anybody else ever again. Like that's just not, it's ludicrous. So I love to hear you say that. Um, yeah. So I'd, what, I'd also what, add on, I'd add on that, that um, if oftentimes when, someone has a bad experience with a volunteer or a volunteer doesn't have a great experience, it means they weren't in the right role. It means we weren't engaging them in the right thing. And, um, you know, you, you talk about how, 
we a lot of volunteers across the the United States, especially but across the world, are are retired. Um, so they have more time, but they're retired from you know maybe being a CEO, maybe being a principal of a school. Those leadership skills transfer. I I can teach yes. how to do. You know, I can teach about the Red Cross and our mission. I can teach how to dis distribute emergency supplies after a disaster, how to work in a shelter. Those leadership skills that come from experience um, are really important. And the other thing that, you know, that a lot of people miss out on is, yeah, it, it's easy to say, okay, someone who's a retired colonel um, in the military, they have leadership skills. Like, that's obvious. Um, but then, a, you know, a trap that we fall into is only focusing on that. And we see, oh, there's this person who, you know, they were a truck driver for 40 years, or they currently work at a convenience store. And um, there's this concept that, you know, they don't have leadership skills, but more often than not, they just never had the opportunity. And I've seen just as many individuals come from what most people would consider non-leadership backgrounds step up and do amazing things when given the opportunity, opportunity. when given the support, when given the, the great work. Yes. And okay. It's just so amazing. I, I'm loving every bit of this. So here's the question that I have for you. Man, so many. They're so they're just coming fast and furious. I need to start writing them down. Okay. Um <laughs> so let's say you empower this volunteer and you give them all of this. Ugh power Woo! help me okay and then it goes to their head and they start going rogue because they feel so empowered that they've taken it to maybe a little bit they've gone a little bit too far with it how do you handle the fear of that happening in the first place to not even allow somebody to not even like trust to empower because hey this could happen that's part one and then part b <laughs> is what do you do when it does happen if and when it does so uh, part a it, it's always going to be a concern in the back of your mind uh that any someone given power um in any dynamic volunteer mm -hmm. employee even in a relationship someone taking on more power than the other person, that's a, that can be a scary thing. You know, that's a, that's a real fear. Um, but you, you just have to trust and, and give people a chance. You know, um, I, I came from a 12 year career in IT and abruptly changed into the volunteer engagement field because someone saw leadership abilities in me and saw skills and uh, gave me the opportunity. And I have, one, I found my niche, I found my home. Um, and two, I, I'm pretty good at it if I won an award, I think. <laughs> and uh, you know, I've got a great, great group of volunteers that, that, that absolutely love me. Um, hold on, but you... <laughs> hold, on, hold on just a second. I'm still trying to take that in. 12 years in IT? Yep. You must be some type of unicorn because usually, IT people are not people people, which is okay, but I don't think I've ever met anybody like you. So this is just getting better and better. We're just peeling the layers. This is well, phenomenal. Yeah, well, and it goes back to what we were talking about before in that I, I may not have had any long-term skills around volunteer engagement. I've, I had been a volunteer for all of my life with various different organizations. I've done training all of my life. So I have a lot of skills that move over, but then there's a lot of things from the IT world that I've been able to put into use. So, you know, I try to identify how can I streamline processes to make it easier on the volunteers? You know, if, if I can have it to where they click a couple buttons and it sends out a you know, mass email or it generates a recognition certificate, that saves them time. And they can focus on, again, their personal mission, not the administrative work. Um, so our volunteers are the same way, you know, I, I'm no different than they are. They came from a different background and, you know, we, we can, we can really bring them in. Um, go, going back to the part B of your question is, is what do you do when power goes to, you know, someone's head or they really take on a bit more than they should, or, you know, start shifting directions. I would say that most people I know have worked in a job that had a power tripping supervisor. 
<laughs> especially if you've ever worked in customer service <laughs> or worked in the food industry or work in things like that. Or just um, worked at all. Like <laughs> right, right. So unfortunately it happens. Um, but you know, more often than not, if whoever that individual is, again, doesn't matter, volunteer or employee, if they do, if the power does get to them a little bit and, and the, the, you know, control and things get to them a little bit, it doesn't mean that you immediately, you know, have to get rid of them. There, there was a reason that they got entrusted with that power to start with. And we don't want to throw that away. You know, we want to take that and we want to, um, get back to the roots of it. So, you know, again, just a coaching conversation, reel them back in. Um, there's also a chance, you know, we, we have to, as leaders of volunteers, as leaders, period, we have to be aware that sometimes the mistakes like that, and I would consider that to be a mistakes that are made, actually may come back to us. If I didn't set appropriate guardrails, if I didn't make sure there was a clear vision, then it's more easy to, you know, to, to unintentionally take the latitude and start making decisions that aren't in align with, with things. And, and I know I've made that mistake before. Um, and I know I've learned from that mistake. And if we keep learning from, you know, things like that and, and helping people grow, I've had people, volunteers who, who have done that, but then after coaching, after, you know, setting, you know, better expectations, after just having good conversations about what their intention was, I've never heard of a malicious intent. It's always, well, I know I can get this done better or this will, you know, the volunteers will appreciate this or, or you know, it's, it's always a positive thing um, that once we get back to that, once we get back to the root of it, it, these volunteers have been great volunteers. And not only that, they've been some of, you know, my mentors, e even if they report to me, they still have mentored me and helped me learn things that I wouldn't have learned otherwise. Right, right. Okay, so... What I am hearing is clear parameters and clear boundaries and reminders of the vision from the get-go, from the start, setting those expectations builds immense trust, trust that allows you to empower the volunteers because now you're operating off of a um, kind of like an honor system. This is what the expectation is. These are the boundaries to work within. I trust and believe in who you are and what you have and what you bring that you will operate within those boundaries. Go forth, do your thing, call me if you need me. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm hearing. Right. Well, and you know, yeah. That is so yeah. powerful. Um, and I just feel like a lot of people listening to this are going to be like, man, that's great. But man, whoo, how do I do that? Or even better yet, what if they're in the middle of it and those boundaries were never set to begin with? And now you have to rein them back in. How do you how do you do that? How do you work backwards? You just have to have honest conversations. You know, uh, there's a lot of fear in those situations on what do you say? You know, there's a million questions. What do you say? What do I do? How do I handle this? I don't want to, you know, make them mad. They're a great volunteer. I don't want them to leave. Um, you know, we play all that in our head. It's, re it's really easy to, to get stuck in that loop. Um, but it really just starts with having an open and honest conversation and um, understanding, you know, what their point of view was, understanding what their intent was. Um, and then the, the biggest recommendation I can always make, and this is with any situation, again, volunteer employee, spouse, children, neighbor, any relationship, because at the core, that's what we're doing here. We're doing relationship management. Any exactly. relationship is, is find that common ground. You both are part of that organization for a reason. So find that common ground, that's the foundation. And then you build that, that relationship, you build that experience, you build the role, and it, it's easier to make some adjustments. And when you find the foundation, you know, I, I'm gonna use the, men, the metaphor of a house. When you find the foundation, well, then you can see, okay, we don't necessarily have to tear all the walls down. 
let's let's make adjustments where we need to and you know and and try not to make sweeping adjustments either because that's stressful for everyone if you can do it incrementally uh to get someone you know where they can be successful in the mission it 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 takes time and a personal investment but it pays off the return on investment is absolutely astronomical and uh you know it's just it's amazing work i love it okay this is giving me life. Thank you. It's giving me life at eight o'clock in the morning. Yes. Thank you. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, and this might be a strong word, but the hierarchy of how, of how everything works. Because if you have over a thousand volunteers, you clearly don't have the capacity to build a relationship with each one. So what does the structure, what does that structure look like? Yeah, and that's and that's a wonderful question. Um, in in an organization like the American Red Cross, especially with uh, responding to disasters, we have very very well defined tables of organization or hierarchical structures that allow us to um, be able to move people into roles and make decisions and based on experience and knowledge and and things like that. Because when we respond to disasters, you know, we don't have time to figure out okay, who's who, what's what by having sort of some set structure in place, it, you know, similar to like FEMA does or emergency services or fire departments do, um, it, it allows us to be able to move more quickly. But in the day-to-day -day work, what we call blue sky work. Um, so when we're not responding to a disaster, blue skies, it, you know, it may not actually be blue skies, but a no disaster day. Um, the the structure is, is just like you would set up it, really any team. We have team leaders, we have team members, uh, team leaders report to other leaders or regional leads or program leads um, or program managers. Um, and it, it, you know, it's just, it's, it's a well-defined structure, uh, but it's different based on each team. Um, in my role, there are six functions that really, uh, you know, fall under uh, my peer partner and I, training, leadership development, deployment, onboarding and screening, recognition and appreciation, um, really all you know all of these functions that are important to the volunteer experience and each one of those functions has a lead over it and we bring our leads together to to work together and collaborate um, as leads within their teams they bring their teams together to work together and collaborate uh, there's a lot of matrix management and and how we set things up where um, you know one team member can go to another lead for information or support and and having that structure, um, but you know the the important part is that anywhere in that structure that there's an employee, there's a volunteer equal. Um, and anywhere in the structure where there is a volunteer, there's an if there's not a direct employee equal, there's an employee that has responsibility for supporting. And so everyone knows who their supervisor is, but they also know who their support team is. And, you know, as an employee, my support team is mostly volunteers. And, uh, and I'm very lucky for that, um, to have that and to have their support and, and experience. I love that. So are any of your, and I don't even know if this is the right terminology, but are any of your volunteers considered like, in capacity like full-time volunteer and part-time volunteer or how does like how do the hours work because i i'm hearing employee and peer partner so i mean do you have somebody volunteering like 40 hours a week yes yeah wow. we have volunteers that get 40 hours a week um on my specific team of 40 that supports that greater team of a thousand uh almost half of those volunteers do about 20 hours a week but the, the key is um, our, our point of success has really been between my peer partner, French and I, focusing on um, meeting people where they are. And I know that's, you know, that's become a catchphrase and that's, you know, it's a buzzwords, but it's really important. I have volunteers on our team that do four hours a month. They do a really critical task and they enjoy it. I have a volunteer on my team who just does data entry um, and in the past three months, she's only done like 10 hours, but right. she, she, she loves I would it. Say, I would say, let's not put just in front of that. 
Let's just right. say she does data entry Fair. because Fair. let's take Fair. that four letter word out because let me tell right. you, I'm sure the data that she's putting in is very, very important, important. Is. but I understand what you mean. I understand what you yeah. mean. <laughs> so, well, yeah. And so each, and thank you for catching that. Usually I'm better about that, but for each individual, they, you know, they're going to find joy or the feeling that they've been able to give back or move the needle or, you know, whatever their motivation is, they're going to find a way to connect. And if we can encourage that and create an environment where they can, you know, feel supported and um, however many hours they want to give is exactly the amount of we need them for. It's funny how that works. You know, if they want to give two hours, I need them for two hours. If right. they want to give, you know, five minutes, we, we need them for five minutes. And, um, they they just you know by by having ownership over their own pieces um and those pieces being you know things that they're interested in it just it, it's so successful and the hours just come naturally and you know i we're very lucky if if we were to combine all of the hours from that team of 40 it's really like having 20 full-time employees yeah um but really, it's the reality is it's 40 amazing volunteers. Yeah. And we couldn't get those experience. Again, we couldn't get those skills. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's fantastic work.